Say game time. Game time. Yeah, good job. That was really good. Uh, it is game time. Part three today. The title of the message today is a question. Me? Team or me? Team or me? I think you know the answer. Anybody been on a team before or, or, or somebody made this statement to you? Uh, well, team, there's no I in team. Right, you've heard that? And then, of course, there's one snarky person on the team that will think for a minute in all of their smarts and say, well, there is me in team. You're not playing in the game today, right? That's what you would say. That's what you would say today. So I, I want you to hear, for, I just wanted to get rid of that for just a moment, just right up front. I want you to hear as we go through this, because this is very much a church series of messages called Game Time, as we go into this, that there's a bigger context than just me by myself. The Lord is doing something more in my life than just my four and no more. The gospel has come to, for each person individually, but once you gain a revelation of what Christ did for you and in you, he now wants to do it through you. And if he's gonna do it through you, he has something in you that he wants to give to other people. The things that you've gathered and the things that you understand and the life that you've been through and the life that you've lived and you have perspective and you have revelation, it's not for you just to keep it. It's for you to, it's for you to graciously give it. He did it for you. Now it's your job to go and further the gospel, further the kingdom through your life. It's not just about, I'll give you the answer right up front. It's not just about me. It's about the team or the greater understanding of the gospel in your life. It's what James in 1 and 22 said. He said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. What an what a, what a awesome scripture that on the surface when you read it, you're like, oh yeah, well, I got that one. Well, how much of what you've got that you've heard are you waiting to still do? Probably that list is longer than you want it to be. If we were really honest right now, we'd say, there's a whole lot more that I know than I'm willing to actually do. But from a kingdom perspective, and what Christ has done for us is there's an assignment to go do all the things that we've learned. And so that's my prayer today as we go through this series is that you hear some stuff and that you quickly ascribe to the fact that now I have some things to do. Not, not in some kind of like heavy thing or I got homework, now I got to turn it in. Pastor's checking our assignments. Ugh. No, it's none of that. But the Lord's got something for me. He, 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 he wants to use me. We prayed that prayer two weeks ago. A very deep and, 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 and earth-shattering prayer. It's only three words. God, use me. And then last week, we said the next move is our move. How many people, they're, they're praying and they're saying all these things and they think it's that God's the next move. No, you're the next move. Amen. The Lord's got something for me. And that's what Jesus said in John 17 and 18. Jesus prayed to the Father in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Did you know that you have an assignment that's uniquely fashioned and tailored to you? God's not asking you to become somebody else. He's, but he created you. He wants you to be you. How silly is that when we say it out loud? Oh, you're trying to change me. No, I'm trying to tell you what God's done in you and how he's created you. I want you to go be you. The voice went high right there. That means that was a really important point. So you could say it this way. If I'm gonna make a difference, I have to be different. I want you to chew on that this week. If I'm going to make a difference, I've got to be different. That means I respond to circumstances and situations differently than other people. I'm going to respond with a kingdom mindset, with a kingdom understanding. The, the Bible in, in this series that we're in right now and in, in, in the previous series, I've highlighted this, but we see the flesh and the spirit and, and we see that truth in, in, in Romans 8 and in Galatians 5. And if you read, um, do I have that right? Romans 8. 
Yeah, Romans 8. Romans 8 in Galatians 5, you see this description of living by the Spirit or living by the flesh. Now, here's something that I want to give you right up front because many people, as, as they read that or they hear that, I, I want to go right after it. They think that there's this constant war that's being waged between the flesh and the Spirit. And if you know anything about the cross at Calvary and, and, and Christ going to the cross and coming out of the tomb, his work is finished. The battle is over. He has won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. He's won the victory over my propensities in my flesh to want to move a certain direction. All I have to do is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things, the old things, the old nature has been passed away. So, so how do I move forward in this area between is it team or is it me? Well, you have to take selfishness and you have to crucify it, as Paul said. I'm going to crucify the flesh. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul said. Not longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I crucify the flesh, so to speak. I put that down. I highlight who I am in Christ Jesus. It's amazing to me that when you focus on Scripture and you focus on what God has said about you, you stop worrying about what you think about you. And the revelation of it's about team and not about me starts to really come to the surface. We know this to be true as parents. I mean, the, the, the way that we see this in the natural is you watch a toddler want only things for themselves. Anybody ever see the toddler? You just turn them loose and it's me, 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 right? It's just all about them. Yep. <laughs> one of my, one of my uh, uh, most shocking revelations as, as I went from being a, you know, a, a young man to a, still a young man. Let me figure that out. I was a younger man, and, and then I moved to a young man, and here I am still young. But I, I grew into adulthood, and I came to this. I tried. It didn't work. <laughs> I came to this revelation that, you know what? Adults, big people, can act like toddlers if they want to. Right? And so that immaturity and that flesh and that me, 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 forget about team, can actually be a part of your adult life if you so choose. Yes. Amen. Amen. And it's tragic in the body of Christ that we would know Christ but not let Christ flow through us. That would be one of the most horrible things to say that we know Christ he has redeemed me, he has set me free, and then none of that has been released through my life. That's what we're talking about today. Is it team or is it me? You with me right now? So if I'm gonna make a difference, I have to, I have to be different. Paul said that when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I wanna offer to you today that there are some much more deep and profound things that are beyond just me, that are beyond just the flesh. So we could take it this way. We'd say, you know, the flesh in selfishness is the enemy of true ministry. It's the enemy of service of seeing my life and what God's done for me to be an act of service, right? If I'm focused on myself, it's just all about me. But if I'm focused on service, if I'm focused on ministry, it's important for me to understand that selfishness is the enemy of service. You with me right now? We're laying some groundwork here. I've made this, I've made this bold statement. Let me stand back here. It makes it more bold. I've made this bold statement a few weeks ago, and I think a week or so ago I said it again. I, I, made this, I made this bold, bold statement. I said, it's selfishness that is the only roadblock to all-out revival in the city of Denver. And everyone was like, I got to think about that for a little bit more. I'm not sure that I agree fully with that. It's true. Selfishness is the root of some of the most perverse things that we see in the earth today. I'll offer to you that addiction at its root is rooted in selfishness. Abuse of all stripes and kinds 
the most heinous, disgusting, grotesque, horrible things in our world that we see that are under the category of the umbrella of abuse are rooted in selfishness. Adultery, the breaking down of the covenant of marriage, when adultery is found and known and seen and manifest at its root is selfishness. So when we come to that understanding and we would ascribe those things are true, I, I, you probably know some word, you know some scripture and you're like, yes, that's true. And then when pastor gets up and said, the only thing stopping the city of Denver to be turning upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ with all out just revolution and revival that, that impacts our schools and, and our businesses and every part of society is one thing, selfishness. I would offer you that that is precisely true. Here's a few examples as we head into our points here in just a moment. These are meant to be funny. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Get to the other side and then we'll, we'll see. Selfishness or service. Now, some of you have young children now. Some of you had young children yesteryear, and you can remember when they were young, but now they're adults. So just remember back for just a moment. This might help explain a whole lot. Are you the type of person that when the baby cries in the middle of the night, it's 2 a.m., that you hop out of bed, ensuring that your spouse gets some extra sleep, you run quickly and you swiftly grab the babe in your arms and you swing them with great nurture and care and calm and soothe the child so that your spouse in the room just next door may continue to sleep and you rock and cradle the child. That would be service. The other side is not service. It's the person who fake sleeps. <laughs> And all of a sudden, we got fake snoring sounds coming from that side of the bed. We're just going to table that for a moment. It's important. Come on now, married people. Let's quickly go to the next one here because I don't want to stay here too long. In the workplace, let's just quick, take a quick, uh, a quick, a quick poll here for just. I'm not looking at you guys because of, of what's happening right now. I didn't plan for that. Okay. <laughs> in the workplace, how many of you are back to work? You're in. You're 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 back to the office or, or workplace with other people. You're, you're a couple of you, just one, just one. That's it. A couple of you. Okay. How many of you are still online? You're fully online in your workplace. Okay, so so this can still apply and even work in the home. So you you you've you've done some something in your workspace and you're cleaning up. You got some trash here. You got some trash that you're holding, and you go to the larger trash bin because everyone kind of shares that larger trash bin, and they put all kinds of stuff in there. And you show up at that trash bin, you're like, "Wow, that's really full. Somebody ought to take the trash out." I mean, you're holding the trash, right? You got it in your hand. You're like, "Who who needs to turn take this? Is crazy? Like, who's not taking the trash out?" And 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 because you're on the side of selfishness, you just kind of pile the trash around the outer edge on the floor of the trash can, and you go find a stapler because you have extra time, and you staple your trash to the top rim of the trash can and make sure that whoever's turn it is to take the trash out, they don't miss your trash. Or are you the person that was like, well, here I am and I got this trash and here's all this trash. I'm going to take the trash out. I'm going to replace the liner. I'm going to get rid of mine and, and I'm going to be on my merry way. I, the person of service wouldn't then turn around and walk back out of the workroom. Hey guys, I took the trash out. Bunch of jerks. Right? That would not be service. That would be self. Now, I'm being silly here for just a moment because we downplay these simple acts of kindness and put service on display as opposed to selfishness on display. 
What would it look like if the body of Christ left, went out of the churches on Sunday and made a radical impact of the small things in their workplace, the small little, I can sacrifice a little bit here, I can do this over here, I'm willing to lay myself down and, 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 and pick up what God's called me to do in this moment. I see the need, it's right in front of me, I'm carrying the trash, I probably ought to take the trash out. Amazing ripple effect would happen if we would start with the understanding that I'm here on assignment to serve serve and not to be served. Ever heard that anywhere? Matthew uh, uh, chapter 20 and verse 26 says this, whoever, this is Jesus speaking, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave or be last. Verse 28, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. So here I've got five simple ways to break free from selfishness, and I'm gonna move through these. Let's all agree that we're gonna move through these. Can we all agree we're gonna move through these points quickly? And we're gonna, come on now, we're gonna move through these points quickly, amen. And then we're gonna get, I need some faith in the room, and then, and then we're gonna get down to the end is where I wanna get to, okay? So we gotta knock these out quickly. Here we go, number one, five ways to break free from selfishness and to have a greater understanding that it's about team and not about me. You ready? Number one is to connect with my family. Connect with my family. Now, on the surface, several of these are going to seem really obvious to you, but I'm coming back to family, and I've been pointing at this. One of the primary uh, uh, mission of, of this church is around family and business, and, and we're seeing the all-out assault and attack on the home. Yep. And the place where we get to see the gospel preached the best and be preached the, the most often, if I can be bold here, is in the home. That when you gain revelation of, 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 of letting the natural man die, as Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, you let that natural man die and you heightened who you are as a new creature in Christ Jesus, it first, it first is on display or it should be in the home. Not the next time you lead Bible study. Not the next time you're on the, on, on the Zoom call. It's in the home. It's the everyday life. If we were really honest, we would say, you know what? I, I see what you're saying, Pastor, because I, I do typically kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, let my hair down, so to speak, as it relates to my family. And I, I kind of save the best of who I am for my people at work. And when I get home, I just kind of let my hair down and I'm kind of my awful, I'm kind of my worst self with my family. But listen, they know me the best and, and they're going to give me grace, right? They're going to forgive me. I mean, we live together. Why wouldn't they? Can, can, can I submit to you that that needs to be flipped? Not that you need to be ugly to people at work. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we need to see the priority of the gospel. I have been reborn and been remade and his word washes over me. Why? So I can stand on the pulpit on Sundays for, for 30 minutes and just be this great display of the gospel and the other hours of the week, I'm just this horrible person to be around? No, the gospel is for every moment of every day and every interaction, especially in your homes. And it's so critical that we get this, we get this revelation. That's why I'm starting out here. As we gather, I've got five points, five simple ways. I want you to gather these things because when we get to the end, it'll be really important as we reflect back on these points, okay? Now, Scripture, because we're moving quick here, I want to give you something right out of Exodus. As we talk about the home, Scripture gives us uh, Exodus 20 and verse 12 in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, and then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God will give you. The Lord starts out the understanding of proper biblical relationships with family or with people with honoring your mom and dad, honoring your father and your mother. And every time that I preach on family or I say something about family, I'll always have at least one person that will get me after service or, 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 or that will send me an email and say, Pastor, when you say family, it just, it, just, it just is like fingernails on a chalkboard. It just hurts me when you say family because of what's happened in my family. There's such a pain and a sore spot there. And at that moment, it is a profound opportunity for ministry. Because if the foundation of our, of our earthly relationships is the family, don't you know that's where the enemy has come to attack us? 
And our ability to relate in relationships, our, our horizontal relationships, those are only healthy and thriving in the way they should be when we have an authentic, real relationship with our Heavenly Father. And if my relationship with my Heavenly Father is good, then I can have, I can have good external relationships, healthy and godly and biblical ones. I'll submit to you, you keep that same truth running down in the natural that kids, when they have a good uh, godly relationship with their mom and dad and that balance that should be there, they will then have the best opportunity to have healthy relationships themselves. And if you don't think that the enemy is about destroying the body of Christ at its roots, I want you to think for just a moment about family. And if we could take all the revelation that we have and just put a pause on the marketplace and put a pause on all this other stuff, and we just said, God, I want an all-out heaven being released in my family. I'd offer to you that then every other component of your life could be radically transformed. I'm pretty sure it's why the only commandment with a promise is to honor your father and mother. God did not say that if you will not steal, I will make you a billionaire. He didn't say that. He didn't. He just said, don't steal. There's a whole lot of reasons we'll get to it, but don't steal, okay? When he says, honor your father and mother, it's the only commandment with a promise. You will live a full, fulfilled, satisfied life. Why do you think he said that? Because there is a, an extreme connection to healthy relationships. And in this moment of killing the flesh, the old man, and giving life to the new man of who I am in Christ Jesus, this is where it starts. It starts in the home. You good? That's number one. Number two, did we get this one corrected? Number two, encourage my colleagues. Number two, encourage, hey, am I good? Encourage my, I had a typo. It happens. It's the first time in my whole life I had a typo. <laughs> first service was beside themselves. He spelled a word wrong. We got it fixed. Here we go. Encourage your colleagues. How important is it to recognize as we talk about me or team or team or me, killing the flesh, releasing the spirit, that we recognize encouragement is something the body of Christ should be known for. It's my desire as pastor that the people of Legacy Chapel only tell other people that they go to Legacy Chapel if they're an encourager. I want all the complainers and all the critical people to just go sit in the corner and don't tell anybody that you come to Legacy. But I want everybody who's an encourager and an uplifter and they speak life to tell folks you go to Legacy Chapel. We know in the workplace, right, there's all kinds. There's the upbeat person, there's the down people, right? The negative Nancy and the negative Nelson and all those other folks. And then and, and, and there's the person that, that, that is always joking around, you can never have them serious. And then there's the person that's always serious and they can never take a joke, right? The workplace is just made up of just a cast of characters, isn't it? But in the body of Christ, how about across the board, regardless of personality, if Jesus is your Savior and Lord, what comes out of you is encouragement more than any of that other stuff. Stuff. Now we're talking about killing the flesh and highlighting the spirit. The old man is gone and the new man has come. Anybody ever reflect back on your life that who you are on Sunday is different than you who you are on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday? Nobody raise their hand. Everybody keep looking cute. But there are moments in our life as we're working through the busyness of the day and circumstances where we're like, I wish I would have released the spirit right there and not myself. <sighs> right? You kind of end the day and you're like, man, I want that moment back. I, I, I want that moment back with my with my colleague, I had, to, I had a moment to really impact them. And you saw it after the fact. 
And you're like, ah, okay, Holy Spirit, the next time that comes up, I, my life, I'm going to be known as an encourager. Paul says it here in Ephesians 4. Do not use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those that hear them. One of, one of, the, one of the best places in the 8-hour, 9-hour, 10-hour, 12-hour workday for us to release the Spirit, to kill the flesh, to, to, to represent that it's game time, that I'm being used by the Father, is to be an encourager in the workplace. Hey, Amen. That's really good, Pastor. We appreciate you. All right, number three today. Let's keep moving. Number three is to pray for my friends. Pray for my friends. What happens when we pray for our friends, here it is, 1 Timothy 2 and 1, it says, I urge you, Paul says to Timothy, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. As you make your request, plead for God's mercy upon them and give thanks. What transpires in the moment of prayer, as we, as we look at the, the underbelly of selfishness, what happens in prayer is you start praying for people and you start praying for them by name is you start covering them in the word, right? The word teaches us as we pray, we should pray the word. Don't pray my own feelings or my own words. I wanna pray the word of the Lord. I'm gonna pray the word of the Lord over their life. You get their name. Maybe it's someone you're struggling with. Maybe it's somebody that you're excited about and it's a new relationship and you just start praying for them, not just well wishes. You start praying the word of God over them, Lord, that they are the head and not the tail. They're going over and not beneath. You start praying the word over them. What happens as, we, as we're working ourselves into seeing that it's about team and not about me, as I start praying about them, it actually starts softening my heart towards that person. So not only am I releasing heaven over their life and opportunities and blessings start flowing because when the saints pray, the earth, things in the earth move. We know that's true, right? That's in the Bible. We know that as we pray for them, things move, but what also moves is my heart. And the positioning of my heart towards that person, that when I pray for my friends, I'm actually starting to prepare, whether I realize it or not, I start preparing myself to impact them for the kingdom, and I start, I start pushing away by the Spirit, and literally selfishness starts to melt off of my life. Watch the, the, the inverse connection here. When my prayer life is at an all-time high, Selfishness is at an all-time low. I'm preaching really good right now. And when, you're, and when you're struggling at a place of selfishness in your life where it's really all about you and you're really going through a rough time and, and, and you got this rough patch, maybe you don't have people around you or maybe you pulled yourself out of relationships and it's just all about me, 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 and you're acting like a toddler and selfishness is at an all-time high, can I tell you what, that's what an all-time low? Prayer. Prayer is at an all-time low. So as we pray for the people that are in our life, what's happening is, is I'm being prepared to release the kingdom the next time I see them, the next time I interact with them. And I'm ensuring that selfishness, I like saying it that way, is just melting off of my life. You struggle in the area of your, you can apply this to your marriage. You can apply this to a business relationship. You can ap apply this to a childhood friendship. You can ap apply this to a rivalry and a sibling relationship. You can apply this to a grandma or grandpa that, that's just underneath your skin. You just start praying for them and praying the word over them and watch the kingdom be released through your life and selfishness just be melted off of you. Amen. That's number three. Number four. Remember, these are quick hits. You guys are doing good. We're moving forward. We're doing good. Number four, here it is. Invite others to church. Talking about, talking about pushing out selfishness, letting it just melt off of your life. Now, as pastor of this church, when I say invite others to church, warning, I'm about to say something you've never heard probably before said from a pulpit from a pastor. Here it is. I am not saying to only invite them to Legacy Chapel. So hear me for a moment. Now, we, we all know Legacy continues to be voted number one in churches across Denver, right? We know that. We get it, right? Best preaching, huh? Is it worship? Like, we get it. Okay, 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 okay. We get it. <laughs> but, but if we truly have a kingdom revelation of what God's doing in the earth, 
your conversations with people as the Lord would organize them and set them up is not just to wrangle them and put them in a headlock and bring them to legacy. It's to have an authentic relationship of saying, because you're probably going to get into to probably a deep relationship about a, a family member or a conversation or something's going on. They don't like the boss or they don't like you or whatever the conversation. You would say, well, where do you go to church? Like, where do you worship? And, and you get into that conversation. And listen, at that moment, don't fall down on doctrine and theology. I believe the Holy Spirit is big enough that if you just encourage them to get back into church and get, get, get back connected to the body, you're going to start building your relationship with that person enough that you'll be able to start inserting some things and showing some things in scripture, but just get them back connected into the body of Christ. Don't start combating Oh, I've heard about that church. They're just really upside down in their theology. They're just really bad. You want them to have a heart towards God and say, I want to really encourage you to get back connected into the body of Christ. And you want to set that conversation up so that we can have more of these conversations. Invite people to church. You know what's going to happen in that moment when you start inviting people back to their church? Which is, by the way, what I just said. Selfishness cannot be found. I have no ulterior motive. I want to see God's best for you. I, 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 have no re, I have no dog in the fight, as they say. I just want you to know him and him to be known and seen and revealed in your life and let the kingdom of God just be... You could say those words and they would say, oh, well, my church never talks about that or I've never even heard that before. We just, we just do nine by 13 baked goods all the time and baked pans and we just share popcorn together. Like I, right? They'll start, they'll start, it'll start stirring in them. Like, tell me more about what it is that you're saying. Selfishness cannot be found. That's number four. Invite others to church. Number five. Show kindness to a stranger. Show kindness to a stranger. John 13 and 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I am so passionate about the body of Christ living out the gospel. I want us to be the gospel to people we don't even know. Now, in the real most of us only do good things or good deeds or spend extra time for people that we do know. Okay, maybe I'm the only one. But the Bible teaches us that if there's somebody in front of me or there's a need in front of me, it's my responsibility to fill that need. Jesus challenged the, the, the Pharisees of the day and their thinking on this front where they said, and he said this in Luke 6 and 33, there in your notes, he says, if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. So that's like what the, what the world, so to speak, does. How radical would it be for us to start showing acts of kindness to people and let the power of God start flowing through just simple every day. Hey, let me help you with that. Let me open the door for you, ma'am, sir. And you start doing kind things to people. That's how I was raised, kind of that Southern hospitality. So that just flows out of me. I'm not being condescending. I'm not being judgmental. I'm not being, it just comes out of me because that's how I was raised. Ma'am, sir, open the door, all that. Like, that's just what flows out of me. If we as the body of Christ started saying, I see you as a person and I recognize you and I'm gonna do something kind for you, you want, to, you want to see an all-out release of the kingdom of God. Let's get everybody at every church to start doing this, and you watch culture change overnight. Amen. Amen. Now, you take all five of those things, five, five simple, easy ways. You see them right here in my hands? They're kind of, kind of big. There's a lot of them, right? It's like I got... Take those five for just a moment, and we're going to apply. And maybe, maybe it's in every, maybe you've got something in every one of those areas, maybe just one. And now I want you to see this in Philippians as Paul is describing kind of the other side. And you, you can go through and read all of Philippians too. He, he's, he's talking about the other side. What's the output? What's the outcome? What's the deliverable of somebody who's no longer selfish? What does it look like? 
what's on the other side, I'll give it to you now, what's on the other side of selfishness is humility. Watch this. Philippians 5, excuse me, 2 and 5 through 8 says, your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, right, he was a big deal. He was the Messiah. He was the called, he, he was the one that was assigned to save the whole world. He was God, but he did not demand, the Bible says, and cling to his rights as God, but he himself, or he made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on the cross. Humility is the, is the byproduct and the output of the spirit, whereas selfishness is the byproduct and the output of the flesh. So when I no longer, in the certain areas or in every area of my life, what you'll see is you'll see humility on full display. Now, I know that humility, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come right at it as we end here today, humility has some, has some perverse, if I could be strong, has some prefer, perverse definitions of what it is, and I wanna give you a, a scriptural context because Paul here is saying that you should be like Christ. How many know that's a pretty good person that you should be like? And who Christ was is that he humbled himself. He obediently humbled himself to go to the cross for you and I. He said, you know what? I am this, but I'm willing to come and, and lay my life down for, for all of humanity or for my brother and sister. I'm gonna lay my entire life down for all of them. Now, here's the thing about humility where people get it up, they get it twisted. And, I, and I've got to correct this here for just a moment. And here it is. The word humility for most people, we think that we're supposed to think of ourselves less. W wouldn't you? agree that, that typically if you say humility, a prideful person thinks about themselves all the time, right? So humility, I want to think of myself less or less frequent. If you go further in that, people say, well, humility is, is I have to think less of myself. But that's not in the Bible. See, humility, when twisted and perverted, that's where we get over into religion and, 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 and pious works, I now have to think less of myself. Jesus in no way thought less of himself or started condemning himself in humility, but he knew who he was in his assignment. I'm part of the team, using the sports analogy a little further. I'm part of the team. There's something bigger here than just me. There's a bigger thing that the heavenly father is about. You and I would say, it's not just about me, but it's who I am in Christ Jesus. Can I offer to you that true biblical godly humility is not you thinking less of yourself, but you thinking more of who you are in Christ Jesus? That's true humility. I start thinking about myself often the way that God thinks about me. That's true humility. What does God say? But you know, fleshly, uh, 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 prideful starts just kind of boasting about themselves. Well, the Bible says that I'm called to boast about the Lord and what his marvelous and wonderful works in me and through me. So what you will see, because I know I got a bunch of strong personalities in the room. Legacy Chapel is made up of a lot of really strong personalities in this room right now. So when you say humility, some people, if they don't have a proper biblical revelation of this, they'll say, well, pastor, are you saying, right, they get pretty strong. Pastor, are you saying that I'm supposed to be a doormat? People are going to walk all over me. I'm just supposed to lay my life, they, they get really dramatic. I'm just supposed to lay my life down and people are just going to walk all over me. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you stand up in the boldness of the gospel and the kingdom of God and say, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I want this to sink in because people, and you don't see it, right? You don't see people's negative self talk about themselves. True biblical humility is thinking the thoughts that God has towards you. He's got a plan to hope in a future. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm going over and I'm not going under. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. Right? That, that's, a, that, that's a reframe and, 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 a, and, a, and a reweaving of the confidence that you have as a believer which is in stark contrast to the nastiness of the flesh. 
And if we can gain this understanding of true biblical godly humility and then we release the kingdom through the saints that are like, look, man, it's not about me. It's about team. And I'm so excited to release the kingdom into my family. Right? That's what you guys would be saying after this message because you're so excited about it. You would say, I'm going to release the kingdom through my family. And next, I'm going I'm to make sure that I'm an encourager. Why am I encouraging? Because what Christ has done for me. And why am I going to pray for my friends? It's because it's who Christ is in me. I understand that the hope of glory is working through me. The hope of this world is working through my life. I'm inviting people to their church. This is, this is just radical stuff. You need to get connected into the body. Who would say such a thing? Somebody who's humble and not full of themselves. Pastor, you're doing really good. True humility comes from a proper identity of who you are in Christ. When you know that you're a child of God, it changes the way you live regular, ordinary, everyday, simple life. And the entire kingdom is released through you. Now watch this for just a moment. We're gonna end with this scripture. This was, this is one of those moments, I don't have them... I don't have them every day, but I, I, I do have them often where scripture just it completely explodes in my spirit. And, and I want to give this scripture to you. First Peter 5 and 5 says this. Peter speaking says, in the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you, watch this, and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, watch this, but gives grace to the humble. Now we know that grace has been set up in its full measure at Calvary. At the moment that Christ came out of the grave and redeemed mankind back, that grace was made available to every man, woman, and child of every generation. Grace has made Jesus available. You can say amen to that. That's, that's very accurate. But here, he's saying that God opposes the proud, watch this, and he gives, I'm going to act for just a moment, and he, and he gives grace to the humble. I do this stuff for you guys. <laughs> if you can get the picture that grace travels on the train tracks of humility, And you think for just a moment, God's got something for me, and he's making heaven available to me. How is he going to get it to me? He's going to send it down those tracks of humility. He resists the proud. He literally says, we're going to divert that over to here because I got somebody operating in true humility that knows who they are in Christ Jesus that is speaking about who they are as a child of God and they have just profound impact that's going through them. Let's keep sending it through them. He gives, think about that for a moment. He, grace is available to everybody. But the one who's humble, he sends it to them. And if you keep studying it, it's the favor of God as a conduit as a distribution, he just keeps sending it through their life. So when we talk about, is it me or is it team? Can you imagine for just a moment if the grace of God was being released in every direction of your life? That's team. That's not me, right? That's not individual. That's like God's doing something in every direction of my life. That's my prayer is that in every role that I serve in, Brant is a man, Brant is a husband, Brant is a father, Brant is a pastor, Brant as a businessman, Brant as a, as a friend, Brant as a, as a neighbor, right? If the grace of God, get this for just a moment, the grace of God is being sent to that one. Which one? The humble one. 
well, is it, it's not this religious, you know, lay my life down and people just run over me. The Bible actually warns us about false humility. False humility is that, is that religious mindset that I'm going to sacrifice myself and, and I'm just going to just be a doormat to everybody that comes along and then I'm going to stand up and say how holy I am. That, that is religion and it's disgusting. What is, the, what is the kingdom of God and what is true for our lives is, is for us to serve in humility and watch the grace of God and the kingdom of God be released. So I'm here to announce to you prophetically in the spirit that it's game time. It's game time in your family. It's game time in the workplace. It's, it's game time with your friends. It's, it's game time here at Legacy Chapel. What does that mean? That means I have a role to play. I have a position. I have an assignment. I have a, I, this is the family of God that I'm a part of. Well, how are we going to release the kingdom? You guys are not going to forget this. Oh, yeah, that's even better. I like that one. <laughs> Where's the humble? I, he's just going to send, I'm going to send it right there. I'm going to send it right there, like a conduit, a freight train of God's blessing right to your life. The greatest among you, Jesus said, must become a servant. Ministry.